signal. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for braving the weather. I know that what we will do here today will be well worth your effort. Um, Barbara has an announcement um, that she would like to, uh, uh, to give before I start. So, Barbara. You, you can hold the, pl the applause till later. Um, we have been talking with you in section about the fact that we've invited Bernard often to come back and share with us a video in process that he's doing of a memorial service he was invited to as a survivor of Auschwitz that happened uh, a year ago, October, or this, uh, this past October. And we will actually have him in two of our sections not this Thursday, but next Thursday from 5 to 6 and 6 to 7. Um, we are probably going to be in Carson 68, but we will confirm that. We want to make sure their video projector is working. And the 4 o'clock sections next week, uh, mine and Ilka's, will happen as scheduled. We encourage all of you to try to come at either the 5 to 6 or the 6 to 7 or both. Okay, so that is a week from Thursday in Carson 68 at 5 o'clock. Um, we will be meeting with Bernard, who is going to show us um, a video DVD that he um, has done. Bernard, uh, we, we are uh, most fortunate to have three survivors come and speak to, with us today. Um, they're all people who have um, done this before for us. And um, we feel most privileged to have them come and share their stories. All of you have read um, Lucille's book. And... Um, you will get a chance to know a little bit more about Bernard after he speaks here. Um, and Lillian is someone who, who lives right here among us. She's brought some photographs for you to see, as well as a wonderful um, laminated copy of the Press Democrat um, article on her bat mitzvah, which she celebrated last November at the age of 80. It's quite an accomplishment. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah ceremony, but it's quite physically demanding. And uh, Lillian was quite up to the challenge. Uh, the survivors of are, are, our panel today are going to speak. Uh, they're each going to talk for about 25 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have questions afterwards. And through nothing else but uh, being entirely arbitrary, um, Bernard is going to go first. Bernard was a student at Sonoma State University, and I met him um, when I first returned back to school in the late 80s. Um, he's a videographer. Um, he currently lives part of the year um, would you say the majority of the year, or half the year. half the year in Krakow, Poland, and leads tours of places that he grew up. Um, he'll give you a little bit of his biography and emphasize those things he would like you to uh, know. And then uh, after Bernard, we're going to hear Lillian speak, and then Lucille will share her experiences with us. So. Will you please give a warm welcome to Bernard Offen? Just so that you're uh, certain, 
uh, as to uh, a little bit about my past life. So I'm almost 75. Uh, I'll tell you briefly my uh, story, and then I will invite some questions. I will, in that process of uh, answering questions, I uh, present some of my stories. So I don't want to completely tell you my story just like that, and I will invite questions after uh, in a, just a few moments. So I was born in Krakow, Poland in 1929. And uh, I had a family of, uh, extended family, of almost 60 people, of whom only three of us survived, my two older brothers and I. My brothers lived, uh, one in New York and the other one in Michigan. And the third brother, me, keeps wandering around the world, Poland and back here. Uh, when the uh, Germans uh, invaded Poland, they were in uh, Krakow within seven days of the beginning of the war, 1939. And the ghetto started uh, almost two years later, 1941. And I was in the ghetto from 1941 to the end of, which, which was in 1943. And this is uh, the Krakow ghetto and the nearby Warsaw concentration camp, which uh, we were forced to move to after the ghetto was closed down. That's the Schindler List uh, story territory. How many of you have seen Schindler's List? Wow, a great majority. Well, that is also part of my story, though I was not uh, uh, working for Schindler. My mother and sister were working for him in that factory for a very short time. Then they lost that work. That was the, during the time of the ghetto, and they got other work. And they worked for another uh, competitor, we might say, of Schindler's. And his name was Mudridge. And they were, uh, my mother was a seamstress. And she, she and my sister worked there making uniforms. My father worked as a shoemaker. And uh, we were making boots for the German army. While I'm the, on the subject of boots, um, um, if you can imagine a, a German army boot that was about this high, as we were building them, we, we actually were sabotaging many of the boots. What we did was that we made a deep cut where the heel was to be. You understand it was built uh, in leather thicknesses, piece by piece, till you reach the, uh, uh, the height of the required heel. But underneath that, there was a cut. And they, um, in the end, they were suspecting that uh, something was uh, uh, being sabotaged. So they started testing the boots. And one day they came in and uh, they said, they tested the boot and it broke. And they said, who, who made this pair of boots? And it was always written down who worked on what boot. They took him outside and just shot him right down. So that ended the period of where we were sabotaging both pair of boots. Instead, we just sabotaged one boot. But you can imagine uh, what it's like for a soldier to run after he run hard. The, b the heel broke. It didn't come off, but it broke, and you can't run very well. So this was in the Poshov camp. After the Poshov camp uh, was liquidated, we were sent on a transport train to Mauthausen. Mauthausen is 
about 600 kilometers from Kharkov. So if you can imagine uh, Kharkov or the Prashov camp being here, Mulhausen is 600 kilometers away, a three and a half day journey, uh, day and night, with uh, people dying in the cattle car. And my father saved my life many times, and especially in this cattle car. There was such a crush of people that uh, he literally saved me like this. He, I was at the side of the cattle car, and he was here, so he prevented me from being crushed. So when we arrived in uh, uh, Mauthausen, by that time I uh, met my two brothers in the cattle car because they were separated from us in the ghetto. So we literally met on the way to Mauthausen. I did not know if they were alive or not, but we met in the cattle car. We remained in Mauthausen uh, for less than a week, and uh, my brothers were separated from us. My father and I were sent to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is 70 kilometers from Krakow, so essentially you can say, well, here's Krakow again, and here's Mauthausen in Austria. So we were sent back, and it's the same kind of a journey where people are dying in the cattle car. I remember one particular incident. Uh, the, stat the train stopped, and they asked us to, uh, they asked someone to come out the cattle car uh, with a bucket and get some water. So I was picked to go out. That was the very bucket that we all used to relieve ourselves in. But of course it was not enough because it was everywhere. You cannot imagine what it was like, I don't think. So that's the bucket I was given to bring water in. I remember this particular, so we were running to a uh, water spigot, big uh, spigot by the uh, train tracks, and there was a SS man there, and there was a line up to get that water and somehow there was a momentary eye connection with him and he allowed me to rinse that bucket he looked the other way and get a bucket of water and bring it to the train it was the only only human connection that I experienced from from the Nazis no there was one, one other one but I won't talk about that now so that was the journey to Auschwitz. When we arrived in Auschwitz, we, uh, we didn't know where we were. We saw fires on the horizon and we smelled smoke. It was a smoke that we smelled before. It was the burning of human flesh. But we weren't sure. We did not want to actually believe that that's what we were smelling. So we were in the center of the camp. How many of you have seen pictures of uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau where the trains went right into the camp? So there's the camp on both sides, and the crematoriums are in the far end. And of course, we didn't know where the, we were in the beginning. So we're waiting there a good part of the night, and in the morning, a, uh, uh, some prisoners um, started opening the doors and chasing us out of the cattle car. 
and uh, we were made to line up one after another it, it, after, after leaving the cattle car it was a great big mob and gradually they pushed us in a direction where we lined up one behind the other and then my father was ahead of me and I was behind him. Someone, one of the prisoners said to him, I should lie about my age. He didn't understand why. I didn't understand why. But I was prepared to say that I was older than I actually was. This is, by the way, why I have three different birthdays uh, dates of birth in Auschwitz, but actually, legally, I have two. I celebrate two birthdays. It's the truth. And uh, so we lined up. My father was ahead. He went one way. I was told to go the other way. We were being chased. And for a moment, I turned around and he was in a group uh, some distance away and we looked at each other had kind of a eye contact I don't know what kind of eye contact you can have from a distance like to the corner of that room but it was a contact and we knew it was the end we didn't know whether it was for him or for me or both of us it turns out that my father ended up in the, one of the gas chambers and I'm here to tell you the story. I was in Auschwitz-Birkenau for three months. And I was sent out of there in a truck to a subcamp of Dachau. Dachau is essentially close to Munich and I was sent to one of the labor camps uh, and worked there driving a uh, locomotive on the construction site. Throughout this whole experience, because I was younger, uh, somehow the men took me under their wing and helped me and to this day, my, my theory is that they helped me because perhaps they believed, like the Good Samaritan, that someone might help their son or daughter. Well, that's my theory. But I was saved by many men. I was given a lighter job, sometimes an extra piece of bread, sometimes some clothing and that helped me those those little kindnesses helped me to stay alive there were incidents in uh, one particular incident in uh, Auschwitz in Birkenau and that was the uh, capo, who was a gay man, saved my life and he said, tomorrow there's going to be an inspection in. There's going to be an SS man here and when it's your turn to go up in front of him, he says, run up to him close by and at attention, don't look him in the eyes. I was totally mystified why not to look him in the eyes. But I did exactly what he did. And I looked at his boots instead. Who it turned out to be after the inspection. I ran up in front of him just like he told me. And he waved me over to this side. Whoever 
He did not wave. He just write down his number. And whoever number was written down ended up in the gas chamber. And this was occurrences almost not daily, but sometimes daily, where they were murdering people, making room for new arrivals, is what they called it, cleaning house. So who it turned out to be, whose boots I looked at, was Dr. Mengele. How many of you know who Dr. Mengele was? So I can't say that I have seen the man because I just looked at his boots. I couldn't identify him for sure. You know, after which I was sent out to the Dachau subcamp eventually, and that was already 1944. In the spring of 1945, I was. Uh, liberated by the American army from uh, death marches. We were all, all the remaining camps uh, were emptied out and we were all marching down different highways, different uh, side roads to some destination. Uh, some people were murdered at the end of, of this destination. Some were not. Uh, we were one time we were marching this was in daytime uh, we were strafed by American planes it was just a one pass they, they made and some people got killed and they uh, realized they, that it was not soldiers but there were soldiers in the nearby woods so they probably had their uh, suspicions that it might be armed anyways uh, and uh, after the attack, we were reassembled and we were marched further. And uh, how much time have I got? Six minutes? Seven minutes? Wow. Great. Uh, we were marched on, and overnight we were put into what looked like an army camp and uh, in the morning uh, there was an excitement in, inside the barracks I remember looking out all four sides of the barracks through uh, holes in the walls and windows and realized there were no guards none they all left as I was uh, one of the uh, more healthy prisoners, if you can call healthy, uh, starving but still uh, functioning better than the others, I was uh, asked to go and find help, bring help. And I was told to go in the direction from which we came. Not to go forward because we didn't know what was forward. We knew what was back. All along the time that we marched, we could hear thunder of uh, artillery and bombing. And of course, we got straight one time. And so I, I was the only one who left the camp to try and get help. I walked down the road a little bit, then I went into the forest near the road. I did not want to be on the road. And then I crossed the stream. And I w walked further on, and then I heard tank, tanks, or I actually didn't know they were tanks. I, 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 had, uh, uh, I heard sounds of uh, machines. And... Uh, I hid myself in that bombed out house and I looked out the uh, one of the holes in the basement and I saw a tank with a star. I did not know what that meant. I knew 
it was not a German tank. So I kept watching for a while, and then I saw soldiers, and I, they were strange, but uh, I knew it was not, I thought it might, might be the Russians also, because they also had the star. But, and I came out of the house with hands up, and I started shouting so they would notice me, and uh, I advanced to the, towards them. And uh, some of them spoke Polish. I could speak a little Yiddish, so that was, I could speak German a little bit. And uh, they took me to the co company commander. They gave me some food. I told them where I came from and that we need help. That we need help desperately. So they uh, designated two GIs. And they took some extra uh, packs of chocolate and they followed me and I brought them to the camp. We, the, the help did not arrive till about two days later because there was a blown bridge and so they, they couldn't get there. They distributed chocolate. What I didn't know was that the starving human being, chocolate, was like taking poison because we can't digest that. What we needed was bread and soup, not even fat soup, but soup. Out of their kindness, they didn't know, of course. I didn't know. So, that's when liberation happened. It's a long story. After liberation, I tried to find my brothers because I was separated from them. I didn't know if they were alive. I, uh, later on, I found that they were alive, but they didn't know I was alive. So they were not looking for me, but I was looking for them. It's a long story, finding them in Italy six months later. But um, maybe later, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer. I think I, my time is up. Thank you. We're going to have questions at the end. Um, our next speaker is Lillian Judd. Uh, Lillian has uh, brought some photographs that she has. Um, and I hope very much that she will explain to you what they are and that afterwards you'll come down and look at them closely because they're quite remarkable. Uh, Lillian has um, started speaking about her experience um, only recently, um, relatively recently, and she's visited many uh, middle schools and high schools to tell students um, her story. Has anybody heard Lillian, uh, perhaps in high school or middle school, or that you've heard, has anybody heard Lillian's story before? Okay. Okay. Um, like all survivors' stories, um, they're filled with emotion, um, and um, Lillian presents. Um, a wonderful picture of what her life was like before, during, and after her experiences. And so I'd like you to welcome Lillian Judd. First, can you hear me in there? Okay. My name is Lillian Judd, and I am a Holocaust survivor. And I would like to thank Professor Murna for inviting me to here today.
to tell you of my experiences. It's not a pretty story I'm going to tell you, but it needs to be told. If you have any questions afterwards, I'll be happy to answer. I also have these pictures here that I will explain it after if, you'd li if you're interested and you come down and see. I was born and raised in Czechoslovakia. When I was 14, 1938, we were occupied by the, Hung by the Hungarians under Hitler. And as soon as they came in, as soon as the army marched, marched through our section, everything has changed very rapidly for the Jewish people. All the Jewish licenses and permits were revoked, and business people that had stores and department stores had to give up their stores, and, and uh, non-Jewish people came in to manage and take over. But they didn't know how to manage a big store, so the owner had to stay there, was forced to stay there, and teach him how to how to exist. When they felt that they know enough, then they just kicked out the Jewish owner, and it was legally theirs. So it's, it was stolen legally. And that was, a lot of things were ordered right after that. All the, all the young people were called into a Hungarian army, and the Jewish boys were separated and a forced labor camp was created where they were working. They had to work there for nothing. And it was very hard work, digging ditches, building roads, clearing up forests, working in mines, plus the beatings they were getting. Times were hard. I was I, was, I just finished high school and, and started to attend a business course when they came in. And I had to leave it because all the Czech schools were closed and the Hungarian schools were opening. And I just didn't want to start in a Hungarian school. So I, the only thing was left for me to learn a trade. I was learning sewing, which I hated. But I... I I, I, I just did it because there was nothing else. The following years, everything was happening very, very slowly, gradually, and systematically. Orders were given out that we had to wear the yellow star. Which I have here some. on our outer garments. Without this, we couldn't leave the house, none of us. Also, also we were given pretty soon the orders that we would have to leave our homes and uh, being relocated. Where? Why? Nobody answered. We just being relocated and work someplace else. The day came when they, when they gave us the order that the next morning we have to be ready and carry only enough stuff that you could carry in your arms, in your hands, and leave the rest in the house and we come and seal everything, close, lock everything, so that we, you could find it when you come back. But they were lying to us constantly, so this was one of the other lies. We, we, we obeyed the rules because we were afraid, because many of our friends turned to be informers for, for, the, for, the, for our enemies. And they reported us very willingly. And every so often we saw the black limousine with a Gestapo picking up some young people that were maybe just talking. And, and their crime was only being Jewish. And they were to taking them to a building where they were tortured and questioned and tortured them until they said, yes, we were listening to foreign radio, which it was impossible 
because we didn't have electricity there, and we did not have, uh, very few of us owned any radio. But they found always something to, 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 to torture us with. So here we are, next morning we are all ready to go. I walk out with my bundles, with my three sisters and my parents, and I see the other people standing in line, the children with tears in their eyes, the old people crying, bewildered, cold, because it was raining, not knowing what brings tomorrow. And it was just a miserable, very depressed situation, very depressing situation. And as we were walking, we start, they started us to walk along. And as we were walking, I recognized a policeman that I used to know. And he came up to me and he said, if you want to, I, m mother and I will hide you and your sister. And I said, with my sister all together, no, wherever my family goes, that's where we want to go. Oddly enough, just the two of us survived, but we went with the family. We, came, we arrived, we arrived, there were, to every three rows, we were lined up five in a row, to every three rows there were some soldiers standing and watch with their, with their rifles ready to shoot. We came to, a, to the end of the, our city, and it was a brick factory on a large property. And at, at one time, the, there, were, there were there all kinds of um, shelves, deep shelves, where at one, one time they were putting the bricks to kill from, when they took it out from the kiln to, to, to cool. Now it was all empty, and when I looked up, I saw just families there. Jewish families from all around the, the, the villages from around our city. So when I came, when we came there, there was no room for us to, to go into those, those shelves. We had to go and find some, all, all kinds of pieces of uh, cardboard and, and uh, or, or wood and broken, broken uh, bricks, and we just brought it together and somehow we produced a shelter. I, can, I don't know how, but we got some help with the, from the boys, and we made a shelter where we could sleep at night, the five of us, the six of us. We had, we, we had uh, to put on a blanket on the floor, and that's where we slept, six of us. And the situation, we didn't have enough food and all that, but this situation, we were in this place for six weeks. It was very degrading. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. We were just waiting, what's next? After six weeks, they told us that we have to line up. They are taking us further. When we lined up, it was always raining there. It was always muddy. And the little Hitler Jugends were helping them, the ones, the teenagers that were taught how to hate how to, how, to, uh, how to be prejudiced, how to hate a Jew, how to kill, how to maim. And they were hitting us with those whips if we didn't move fast enough for them. So my dad was injured in the World War I, and he couldn't walk fast enough. So I was with him and pushing him and dragging him sort of until we came to a train station. And there were the, all the all the, all the, uh, all those, what is it called? Wagons lined up, the train wagons, where previously they were, um, they were transporting animals in. This time it was for us, Jewish people. And we had to go in and the little, whatever we had left, uh, the little bundles go with us and they were pushing and pushing more and more people in each wagon. And finally, when my dad and I was up, I thought that this was it because that we had hardly any room. But no, they were pushing more people in until we stood there like herrings. And that they were, then they moved on to the next 
wagon, and there were a whole row of wagons, and all those wagons were filled. Then they came and they closed the gates. They didn't give us any food or water or toilet facilities. And I heard the wheels make the noise that, they, that we were moving. As we were already on our way, people needed to go to the bathroom. And there was not, there, so somebody donated a bucket and a couple of blankets so that if someone had to go, someone else had to hold a blanket for privacy. When it was filled up, there was, we didn't know what to do with it. So there were some slits, narrow slits between the, the, the panels in that wagon and we were trying, a few of, few of us were trying to push it out that way, the, the, the things that people eliminated. But it didn't go because outside was the wind and the train was moving and, and it was blowing, it was blown right back in at us. So we couldn't do that either. So we were just leaving it and it was overflowing and there was nothing we could do and it, the stench was terrible and uh, we were going, we were very depressed because it was the most uncomfortable situation that anybody can, ex can, can imagine. We were, I, I looked out uh, uh, at times when we stopped, the train stopped and to, to take on some water or, or coal or something for the train. And I looked out between those slits and I saw faces there, the, the operators there, some of them were had tears in their eyes. They all knew where, I, where we were taking, taken, and they all knew that we were, we were be most of us killed. We didn't. Some of them, I saw smiling faces. We were going through Polish territory, and some of them were smiling, happy that the Jews will be killed. And we were doing this for a while. Then all of a sudden, I hear a baby cry. And the mother says, please give my baby a little water, he's so sick. And the guard says, keep him quiet, and, and, and uh, no water. And, and the baby, like, she couldn't keep him quiet because the baby was sick. And then I heard shots, and after that the baby was quiet. So it wasn't in our, our, our um, wagon, so I don't know who was the person. We went on for, an, for, a, for a, a little while longer, and then we came to a stop. We didn't know where we were. Somebody says, we, we, they welcoming us here. I hear music. And there indeed was some music coming in. And when the gate was opened, we were still blind from the dark, looking out in the sunshine, couldn't see. But when it cleared a little bit, I saw a big sign, welcome to Auschwitz-Birkenau. But a lot of shouting in German, everybody out, everybody out without packages. And shouting and calling was terrible names in German. Like I was, I was uh, fluent in German at the time, but I never heard those words. It was very confusing because they were pushing us with the rifle butt back here down on, on, off the train, of the, of that wagon, and I heard my dad coming down. And as he stepped down, he reached back for his he had a, sort of a, 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 a was a case where he kept, kept his prayer book and his prayer objects that he used every night and every morning. And as he reached back, the SS came and hit him with his rifle butt over his head and over his shoulders, that he collapsed bloody all over and he was dead. And then the SS motioned to, to some of the other heftlings with a, with a striped uniform, and they came and they grabbed my dad's leg and were pulling them on the, on the pavement, his head bobbing. i never forget that. And I said, my dad, they just killed my dad. And I'm crying, they're looking after him. And the SS came up with a, with a rifle butt up again. You wanna go with him? 
And at that time, I, I just got to my senses and I ran to, fi to find my family. And I'm ran, and, and of that, I have a picture here. Where I, they, they, it doesn't show that my dad was there. It just shows that I'm running to look for my family, crying. I caught up with my family, and there was five of us standing in the line, because that's what they ordered us to do, and they were taking us. My mom says, there is somebody separating us, and a, a, an, an officer in a white uniform was standing there with his arms like this, and just white gloves going this way and that way, like a, like a, like a clock or something. And I couldn't see what he was doing, but my mom was on the end, so she could, she said, they're separating us. They, if, if any of you are taken away from me, I'm as good as dead. So I told my little sister, because she was kind of tall for her age, Renee, pull yourself down a little bit so that they, they could go with mom, so she wouldn't be so alone with just Irene. She did it, she listened to me. And she was taken with mom. And I'm still living with a thought. Could she, if I would have been quiet, could she have come with me, with us, and survive? I don't know. I meant well at the time. But I, I, I wish I would have been quiet. OK. Now we are, we are, we are they're pushing us to, to one side. They pushing my mom with the two sisters the other side, and we we're making a couple steps. And I look back to say goodbye to my fa to my mom and sisters. They weren't there anymore. I didn't see them. They pushed them fast around the corner so we couldn't see each other. So I never get to say goodbye to them. At that point, we didn't believe any. We didn't know anything. We believed, we believed the rumors that we are going to work and we're going to get together on the weekends. We found out soon that it wasn't that way. Well, now they're pushing us forward, forward, schmach schnell, los, los, and always pushing and always shoving and, co and call, calling us all kinds of names. And after a while, you know, it, it makes you like, like, like you're not even yourself. You don't even know who you are anymore after all this calling, name calling. And I, in the distance I saw a, bl a, a gray building where um, I saw five people, let in, they let in five people at a time, but I never saw anybody coming out. I didn't know what to make of it. When our turn came, we came to the steps, there were steps, came to the steps and our turn came to go up and I came into this, this room and I saw hair on the floor, tons and tons of hair in every color, every shade. I couldn't figure out where did it come from until they were there, and there were about four or five German SS officers standing there and shouting, take everything off, fast, take everything off. And I was waiting for them to leave because I wouldn't undress in front of a man I wasn't that sophisticated at the time. And I was waiting for them to leave, but they never did. And the girls that helped them started to pull off my, our clo my clothes and throwing it to the ground. I said, why are you throwing my green clothes down to the ground? How am I going to find it? She says, don't worry. You're not getting these clothes. You're getting other clothes. So then she, when I was all naked, she pushed me down in a chair and she took the shaver and she started to shave my head. And I knew where the hair came from. And she cut all my hair from everywhere, and my sisters and everybody's. Then they gave us a piece of soap that was like a rock. And we walked and, sh and pointed uh, to a room, and we walked in there. They let us take our shoes, nothing else. I came in, and I looked up, and I saw I saw faucets on the ceiling, several, and um, I, didn't know, I, I didn't know what is coming next, but when all of us was there, the, uh, the door was shut, and they let the water come out, and we get, got to wash ourselves. 
And that felt good after four days in that stinky wagon. And we, were, we felt refreshed, not knowing at the time that how lucky we were. We got the water. Our families before us and after us were getting the gas. And they were killed and put in the crematorium and burned at the same time. After the shower, without, without a towel, without, without wiping ourselves, they pushed us outside. We had uh, a naked. We had to stand naked outside for hours. They kept coming and ra counting us all the time. There's no place to go, but they kept counting us. Down lo on the lower part, we saw some men walking to, for the same treatment. We just, we just came through. I was so embarrassed. I wished I was invisible and cold, shivering, and since then I'm still cold all the time. After hours, they took us in and they gave us clothes. And we put on the clothes, they gave me a mini skirt and a short sleeve blouse without any underwear, stockings, the freezing. And finally, after another wait, they took us to the barracks. When we came to the, co co barrack, the court, there was a court there, and there was a small window I noticed. And I looked up in that, and I saw a bunch of people that looked like monkeys. And I, I looked around, and it was us, but now, which one am I? And I couldn't find myself. So I went like this and this with my head. Finally, I located myself, and then I started to cry. What did they do to me? How ugly did they make me? And then we were placed in that camp by a block elder, which is a supervisor, and we were put five of us in one dirty uh, bunk bed, which had nothing on it except the wood, and there were five, five uh, layers, so that 25 people were placed in one bunk bed. And in that, in that barrack, there were several, several bunk beds. Well, at night we were, we were getting very tired, uh, very worried, and we ran, out, ran to the gate. And the block elder comes out, where are you going? We want to see our family. He says, and she was smiling. He says, yes, and she opened the gate. First she sent us back, but we came back again. Then she opened the gate, and it was dark outside already. And we looked up, and the red, the, 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 the sky was a vivid red, a scary red, and the, the stench from the burning flesh was unbearable. I was getting sick. And she says, you want to see your families? There are your families burning, and pointed up to the sky. Then we had to believe her, and we came back to our, to our bed, and we cried all night. We didn't eat the dinner that they brought us in because we, the, the one that we thought that it was for the animals that we are going to feed. And that, that's how Auschwitz started for me. And I think I'm the end of the time. Well, I can't talk anymore because my time is up. But thank you very much for listening. Yeah.
Final speaker is Lucille Eichengreen. Um, hopefully, if you've uh, done what you're supposed to be doing, you you know a bit about Lucille. Um, she has been most gracious to us for several years, coming back each year to speak to us about her experiences. Um, she's a world traveler and has spent a great deal of time in Europe. Um, going back to Germany and uh, certainly in other places and I'm sure she's going to tell you some of that today. Would you welcome Lucille Eichenberg. I spent 12 years of German horror, a childhood and an adolescence stolen for me, endless, painful, years without hope. I'm a Polish Jew. My parents were from Poland, but I was born in Germany. And when Hitler seized power in 1933, I was eight years old. That summer, going on vacation, the owner of the resort spoke with my father and he mentioned, Mr. Landau, have you seen the change in Germany since January 1933? My father did not reply. And the man continued, there is less unemployment, people are happier, and last but not least, Hitler will take care of the Jews. My father got up. We took the next train home. In the train, I heard a word that I did not know. The word was antisemitism. And I asked my father for the meaning. It took a long time for him to reply. And the answer was, it is when people hate without reason and it is senseless. At eight years of age you don't make sense of it and neither did I. Life in Germany became very restrictive for those of us who had Jewish religion. A professor could no longer teach at the university. A lawyer could no longer practice. Students had to go to special schools and those who could try to leave Germany. On the way to school on November 10th, 1938, we saw the large synagogue in town burning, the Germans standing around and laughing, the books being burned, the holy scrolls being burned, and this is what is known today is the night of broken glass. A German poet said many years ago, a couple of hundred years ago, when they will burn books, they will also burn human beings. And that's a direct quote from Heinrich Heine. After the night of November 9th, the Jews living in Germany were assessed a special tax to repair the damage during that night. Damage which we, which we did not do and damage which ran into the millions. We had to turn over our anything of gold or silver and uh, bank accounts were confiscated. We got a small amount monthly 
and life became very, very difficult, especially for a child. We asked ourselves why, and there was no answer to the why. The grown-ups would say it's a passing phase. It'll normalize, it'll change again, but it never did. My father was arrested on September 1st, 1939. It was the day war broke out and Germany invaded Poland without provocation. My father was treated in accordance with the Geneva Convention and kept in prison for about 10 days. After 10 days, Poland was declared occupied and for all intents and purposes, Poland had lost the war. My father was transferred to Oranienburg, to Sachsenhausen near Berlin, and finally to Dachau. We had no idea what the place meant. When men had been arrested after the night of broken glass and taken to concentration camps, and if they returned six weeks or six months later, we only saw their sh shaven heads, their missing front teeth, but they would not talk. My father wrote a short letter every six months saying, I'm fine, I hope you're fine as well. In January 19, actually it was February, 19, 41, the Gestapo brought us a cigar box, threw it on the kitchen table with the remark, Ashes, Benjamin Landau. The death certificate, which is still on file today, reads, died of pneumonia in Munich. My father was murdered in Dachau. They will admit it verbally, but they won't correct the death certificate meaning the Germans. In the meantime, we had to move from one apartment to the next, from one furnished room to another. I think we moved a total of five or six times. We still went to school, and I worked at night doing some sewing to earn some money because we only got $100 a month for a family of three people, and you couldn't live on that. In September 1941, throughout Germany, it was ordered that Jews wear a yellow star. It was sewn on the left side to the coat or to the dress, and there was one occasion when I took it off, and I went with a neighbor to the opera. I stood in the last row, and I was afraid for three hours, and I never repeated that excursion. The yellow star made us very visible and very vulnerable. We were shouted at, we were beaten up, we were cursed, and for a child it was a miserable life. Even school was no longer a safe place. In October 1941, we received notification from the secret police that we could pack one suitcase and report to a given address not far from the central railroad station and we would be transported east, but that's all it said. After three days, there were 1,150 of us, men, women, and children, we arrived on a railroad siding, no railroad station, nothing. It was just an open siding, and the SS turned us over to men in black coats with yellow stars, black hats, and orange bands. They were called the ghetto police. The ghetto was called Lodge, L-O-D-Z. The ghetto had an area of roughly three kilometers. It was the worst section of an industrial city. It had neither running water nor bathrooms, 
no plumbing. There were outhouses in the backyard. The houses were run down, they were minimal, and a small room was occupied by eight human beings. We saw people on the street and we wondered why they paid us so little attention. They didn't look at us. They were gone, they were going to work or coming from work, they were hungry, they had lived in this environment for two years, and we were the newcomers. It was impossible to get a job. Jobs were handed out either if you had good connections or if you knew somebody. Food was rationed at irregular intervals. We received a loaf of bread for a week later on for eight days, for 10 days, and for 12 days. And hunger was really the one thought that occupied us day and night. Grown men talked of food they had eaten before the war, that they would eat after the war. Food was the one topic of conversation. I got a job, finally, in an office. I said I could type and take shorthand. I could barely manage either one of them. And the office was, the purpose of that particular office was to beautify the ghetto, to install parks, plants, trees, and make it a permanent living place for the Jewish community. After about six months, it was decided by the elder of the Jews of the ghetto, appointed by the Germans, Chaim Rumkowski, that the office was no longer needed and the office was closed. The next job was in an office filling out forms for the German population in Germany for coal rations. After that, I worked in the statistical department, and those records were saved, and they're being published now in Poland. There are six large volumes, and I worked for Dr. Singer, who originally came from Prague for a while. The main object of the ghetto was to provide clothing for the Wehrmacht, for the German army, to provide shoes for the Wehrmacht, hats for the lady in Germany, dresses, you name it, we produced it. There is a book available in Germany now with letters from various stores stating that our work was exceptional and they would like more merchandise because it sold very rapidly. My little sister, who was five years younger, could not find work, but I managed to get her a job in the head factory, and in the back was a little school for children, and she got a lun uh, lunch or a soup at lunchtime, and she worked there. My mother was very sick. She was ailing, and she ultimately died of hunger, and it's a very ugly death because the body, the face, the hands, everything swells up and you stop eating and you die. Every morning in the ghetto, a little black wagon went around and picked up the dead. The ghetto cemetery has 70,000 buried ghetto dead. Occasionally, at the whim of the Germans, there would be a deportation either of the very old ones, the very young ones, the ones able to work or not able to work. And those people disappeared. We never heard from them again. After the war, when I needed a death certificate, I was told that they had been killed in Auschwitz. It turns out now that over 40,000 of them were killed and buried in mass graves in Chelmo, an hour distant from the ghetto. There is no identification and no list 
of those people that were killed. I worked for a short period of time for the evening kitchen and my boss was the elder of the Jews, Ran Runkowski. I was very afraid of him. He was a dictator. He was not an educated human being. And the one remark that he made to me is, I expect you to contact your family in Palestine after the war and take care of me. And being afraid, I nodded my head. The other remark was, if I can save but a hundred human beings, and the ghetto at its height had 160,000 people. It will have been worthwhile. To me, that remark was unacceptable. It still is. The big deportation came in 1942, in September, when the ghetto was under a curfew for seven days and seven nights and the Germans went from house to house, from door to door, and arrested those they deemed not fit for work. The old, the very old, the sick, and 20,000 children, my sister among them. They were all murdered in Chelmo. Ghetto life proceeded almost as if nothing had happened. But prior to the deportation, when the elder of the Jews received notification from the Germans to get the police to provide these human beings, he made a speech. This speech is a matter of record now. And his remarks were, mothers and fathers, hand over your children so that the rest of us may live. The remark has gone down in history. I don't think I have to elaborate further. The ghetto was ordered to be liquidated and it was the ghetto longest in existence in all of Poland in August 1944. The liquidation was not explained but we know today that the Russians were very close and did not advance. They gave the Germans time to liquidate the ghetto. Only 800 young people managed to hide and the rest of us ended up in Auschwitz. I think you've heard enough about Auschwitz and I don't have to repeat it. Whatever you have heard, of course, was true. And from Auschwitz, we were again transported in cattle cars. And after three days, when the cars were opened, I found myself in the outer harbor of the city where I had been born. Stupidly, I believed that being in this place, I might be able to escape. I might be able to get some help that it would be a better life. It was not. I didn't know a soul, and even though among 500 women, I was the only one who spoke German, it was not a better life. It was a hard life. We did forced labor for the Germans, cleaning up American bomb damage, working in shipyards, building temporary concrete housing for Germans who had lost their houses. And it was hard labor with very little protection from snow, from wind, from rain. We all had tuberculosis. We all had pneumonia. The doctor we had was Dr. Giza Pell, who was an assistant to Dr. Mengele in Auschwitz but she had neither medication nor had she any means of helping us. Dr. Pell has died in Israel in the meantime. We were put in Germany to work in three different camps, and they were all sub-camp camps of the large camp Neuengamme in the northern part of Germany. 
in March of 1945, we were transported partly in cattle cars and partly by truck, what we know now a short distance to a place called Bergen-Belsen. The only thing at arriving in Bergen-Belsen were two huge mountains of empty shoes. No legs, no feet, just the shoes. Bergen-Belsen at that time was a place where Anne Frank had died of typhus, which of course we did not know. And typhus was rampant. The Germans did not enter the camp. Food was not delivered into the camp. The bodies lay on walkways in huge pits, naked and unburied and decaying. And we knew that Bergen-Belsen, there was no surviving Bergen-Belsen. On April 15th, we heard the noise of tanks and the people inside the tanks were British. They were on the way north to the River Elbe to cut off the Germans, the Russians, and they stumbled upon the camp. They had no food for us, no water, nothing. But at least they could contact England to see that something came into the camp. That night they emptied a storehouse and they gave us each a two pound can of pork and being hungry we ate the pork and the fat and many of us died that night. Eventually I started working for the British and I remembered the names of 40 SS in the last camp. We picked them up, we arrested them I was threatened by their families and the British drove me to Paris. In Paris I managed in 1946 to get papers for the USA and I came to New York on April 22nd, 1946, not knowing anybody but a classmate and three dollars in my pocket. It took 50 years to go back and it was not a happy visit. We who survived the Holocaust never th thought of saying never again. It took the younger generation, our children, our grandchildren, hearing about our past, coining this phrase. We have been severely criticized for not resisting sufficiently and in hindsight this might be true. We did the best we could under impossible conditions. The ghetto, except for Warsaw, the ghettos, except for Warsaw, were closed tightly to the outside world. We were without ammunition, without help or outside contact. To kill a German would have cost the lives of many of our people. Sixty years later, looking at the past, I too would say, never again. In total resistance to the last man, woman and child would be the only way to go. To have survived with just a few and seeing most of our friends and relatives killed and being reproached for the past 60 years for not resisting is very painful. It reminds me of the novel that Franz Werfel wrote, The Forty Days of Musadak. The Armenians fought to the last man. Nobody survived. I would like to know if those who now say never again would put their lives on the line. I can only hope so. Thank you. have shared with you, they are willing to ask questions that might otherwise seem ones that you would like to keep to yourself, but I assure you, um, they are anxious to answer your questions.
For me, it was a great big For me, I don't think it's on. It's not on. For me, it was a uh, great big anger at what was happening in the world and wanting to tell the story. And that was something that kept me going. So there was no question like you are asking that I could not, it didn't even arise. I gave up and towards the end of the ghetto. It didn't matter one way or another. It certainly didn't matter in Auschwitz. I was ready to die. And we talked of suicide, touching the electrified wires. There was no reason to continue living there was no desire to tell the story and we had in, for all intents and purposes we had given up for me it was a little different I felt that my mom survived, survived and she's, she's going to come home and I was with my sister in Auschwitz and all two and that kind of helped me to hang in there and go on. It only hit me when we came home and my mom wasn't home waiting for us. But by then, I, I, uh, I was on my way to recover somewhat and go on with my life. And it's not easy. How many times I felt that I wouldn't care if I died tomorrow or day, today. But I didn't, I wouldn't uh, kill myself. Although there, it was a great possibility with the, with the electric wires around us. Just throw yourself against it. But I, I believe that God will help us and we'll come home and we can bear witness to what they did to us. That's what I'm doing. Um, I have a question uh, for the field that you also mentioned. Um, in your book you said that um, at one point before you had been sent away that your parents suggested that you go on a boat to England but they couldn't go with you. And then you had also mentioned that someone said they would hide you. Um, looking back, knowing like what had happened, would you have gone or would it have meant I would have stayed. Could you hear the question? I didn't, I didn't get your question. Uh, because when the, the police officer offered to hide you, knowing now that what happened, would you still have chosen to stay with your family, even though you know what happened? What? Does that make sense? Question. If, if you had chosen to do the same thing, uh, uh, when he, uh, a policeman offered you to, to hide you, would you still do it again? I would do the same thing. I, I, I believed in destiny, I still do. And apparently, I would have, if I would have been hiding, whether I would survive or not, that's questionable too. And if I did, I could never forgive myself to let my my family go by themselves. So I felt that I did what I, the decision we made was the right one for me, and um, that's that's it. And I wouldn't I would do the same thing. Like while I'm here, like uh, Bernard and Lillian and Cecile. You guys talk um, like to me. Everything you guys say, it just seems so surreal. Like, like it's impossible that things like this could happen. That you know that you'd have to endure such conditions. Like when you look back upon it, do you sometimes like go, I can't believe that I this I had to go through it. And like, does it ever? Do you ever go and think, okay, I think I'm over it now. But or or is it still like just as real to you as it, like when it happened back then? It's, 
still very real, but you ask yourself, how could it be possible in a civilized society? Why did the world stand by? That you ask, but you know what happened. You can go back and look at the places, for instance, the ghetto is standing. You know it is there. You don't think about it every single day. But you wonder why humanity cared so little. Um, for me, I'm in, uh, uh, most of the time, I'm in a positive state of mind and uh, look at it and reflect on it. Very seldom am I being the, back there. And uh, I. Uh, look at it and see that we literally live in an insane society's world globally. Well, maybe not everywhere, but that we do. Because uh, it is the, the small things that we do where we don't take responsibility that bring on uh, these events for, uh, for human beings. So who are we as a human being, as I keep asking, and uh, uh, working towards towards that. And that's, um, I produced three films, documentaries, and I uh, question that in, in some <coughs> way. When I came home from the camps, I was full of bitterness, hate, and anger that this could happen to me, although most of the times, I felt that I was just out of body, I, I had an out of body experience. I was just watching whatever happened to me that it was happened to some, happening to somebody else. But when I came home, I realized that it happened to me and I was there. But soon I realized that I cannot live with this bitterness and with this anger and hate. And I, I found that I, I snapped at people and I, I wasn't very nice, and I didn't like myself for it. So I started to write about my, my story, and when I, I wrote it, put it on paper, somehow, somehow I felt the relief. With eight, each page I, I typed up, I felt that, that, that I gave up some of it. And soon, <coughs> I wasn't bitter, I wasn't angry, and I wasn't... <coughs> Hate. I didn't hate. I will never forget what, I, what was done to me, but I do not. I do not. I do not carry hatred and bitterness and anger in me because it, I found that it hurt me more than I that, than it could ever hurt those people that did it to me. So this way, I can go on with my life in a normal way. forgive and not to forget. I don't hate them, but I certainly don't love them. And as I said last week, I, as long as I live, there is no forgiveness and there's no forgetting. That'll be up to my children. Um, for a long time, I, I felt the same way about uh, I cannot forgive, and it's true, I, absolutely it is true. I cannot forgive for my family, for anyone else, because if I could, then I'd be gone. I can, but I can forgive for my own suffering, and that's been a great shift for me in order to heal, in order to go on. So I look at it that way now, that it's part of my healing process.
realization came the same day that we really were not free. Bergen Belsen was closed. We couldn't leave it. They had a typhoid epidemic and they were, the British were afraid we would spread it. So how much freedom do you have behind barbed wire? Gradually life became better. But it was a different life. There was no going back. And when I was in Germany last week, I was asked whether I feel like coming home. And I quoted the, uh, the book by uh, Thomas Wolfe, You Never Can Go Home Again, and you can't. Not even after 60 years. There is no home there, and there can't be. And um, to answer the, first, the question before, like Bernard, Bernard said that he can forgive for himself but not for his family because in our religion we cannot for give forgiveness for the people that are dead. We can forgive, uh, give forgiveness by ourselves. And it took, took, uh, takes a long time. I was even angry at uh, I wouldn't buy a German car and still wouldn't but but uh, I I don't have hatred anymore in me and thank God for that um, for me uh, right after liberation I was afraid to actually go out of the camp and it's strange because uh, I knew more or less what was going on inside the camp, but the outside world was a mystery to me and I was fearful of it. And uh, as far as uh, uh, forgiveness, that uh, in the way in which I look at it, forgiving for my own suffering, uh, that allows me to heal myself. Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and you name it. Over a million. That's what gypsies. Yeah. So is your question why do yeah. Jewish survivors? Yeah, it's like you really only hear about the Jewish survivors. You don't hear about other religions or like that. It's just, I, like, have you spoken with um, other survivors? Mm -hmm. I have. Yeah, I met some. I met some prisoners, some gypsy prisoners, in, the, in Auschwitz before they were killed. Yes. Well, all, all of you were at Auschwitz, right? All three of you. So it appears. When you when you were there, you tell your stories about how you were walking around and saw all the SS officers. Did you see any feeling in any of the Germans there? Did when they looked at you, well, I know Bernard said once that you once had eye contact with the SS officer and you felt feeling. Was overall, was there just, did they not look like humans to you? Like when you looked at them, did, did they not have any sort of sorrowness or was it just that they that they just were brainwashed? How did, how did you perceive their feelings when you saw them? They didn't really have any feelings. There is a photograph, I don't know where you have, if you have seen it, of a young German officer looking through the little glass window in the crematorium, in the, in the gas chamber, excuse me, seeing the women and children die and screaming, and then going home to his family and sitting on the floor and playing with his own kids. Mm -hmm. So, no, there was no feeling. They were either brainwashed or it came naturally. I'm not sure which. If you'd like a reference or you can read about that, I can provide that. Many of the uh, uh, German uh, Nessess were brought up in such an environment 
of hatred. And if I was a German, being a lot of them were very logical up in their head without much feeling, uh, and it was presented that Jews are our problem. So if I was logical, I would want to solve a problem. So along they come, the SS and the, not only the SS, uh, and they were doing a mitzvah for their God, and their God was Hitler. And you know what a mitzvah is? It's a, it's a blessing good to good deed, to murder someone, because we were considered vermin. Do you understand that? But human beings are individuals, and if your government tells you to do something, you ought to think there ought to be resistance. You just don't buy it blindly. We Americans did not buy the Vietnam War at the end. Mm -hmm. So the Germans could have done the same, but they hardly did. Could you speak up? Uh, I'll repeat it. I <coughs> what was your connection to religion before the war, during the war, and then after the war? What was your connection to religion before the war, during the war, and then after the war? I was brought up Orthodox religious when I was a, when I was growing up, and I I I learned and held and held the religion. Things happened to me in Auschwitz that I questioned my religion. I questioned even God. After I came home, again things happened to me that I learned that it's in my, things are in my destiny and God is with me all the time. And yes, he gave, uh, I, I had a lot of tragedies in my life, but I felt that God gave me the power, the strength to go on. And I still feel that. I was brought up in an Orthodox home in, uh, in Poland, in Krakow. And uh, however, we were not uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, dressed normally, uh, not in black clothes like uh, some Orthodox people are dressed. Uh, we're modern Orthodox. Uh, I questioned, uh, when I was in the camp, in the ghetto, in the camps, I questioned, you know, why am I here? What did, what did I do? And, uh, mm. You know, if you only open up the gate, let me out, I'll take on a different religion. But uh, uh, in the end, uh, liberation and afterwards, well, I was arguing with God and, uh, uh, you know, uh, who are you and uh, all kinds of things. In, and I was not, I'm not a religious person, I think I'm a spiritual person. And that takes on a larger dimension than just this particular religion uh, that's where I'm at I was brought up orthodox I went to parochial school for 12 years I read and write Hebrew my question to my God is why the children why did he stand by and let the children be killed and so far I haven't had an answer so you might say I'm neither spiritual nor am I religious. David? Now this question is for Lucille. Um, there's a part in your book, you know, where you're going after the SS agents and you're testifying against them. And um, in your writing, you know, you see a certain sense of vindication and triumph. You know, I'm doing it to a certain degree. But I also see, you know, a fair amount that, you know, I think the word is probably terrified. You know, I was terrified. Uh, and, um, I mean, I think in my case, you know, doing that against, you know, these perpetuators of such evil, that would have put me at peace, I think. But, you know, did, did your deeds in testifying and rounding up these people, did they put you at peace? No. No, it was just one of the things that you do, that you have to do. I happened to know their names and their addresses, and it was the only decent thing to do. I asked last week whether any of these 42 are still alive, and I was told one woman is still alive, but they did not want to give me the name, 
and I would not have looked up either. The only satisfaction I had is walk past the prison cells and see him behind bars. Beyond that, I wanted to go to America and uh, be done with it. It was enough. Okay, one last question. get anything from cigarettes to bread and the commodity was sex both for men and for women so it things were available if you were willing to pay the price yes the question was were you able to smuggle things to each other or get things from people while you were in the camp didn't have anything I I did the smuggling when I was in the ghetto. When out of the ghetto, bought stuff and brought it back in. But uh, in the camp, no, I was not able to do any of that. I was too young, and I was with strangers mostly. And uh, no. Okay. Um, thank you. I'd like to, personally thank all three of you. say that I think you're all very brave to be taking these courses and to be studying these things and to hear from us that it doesn't fall on deaf ears. I appreciate that very much. And I would also like to say that when I go to the different high schools or middle schools to talk to the young people, I always like to point out that be aware and if you see anything starting like with hatred, with greed and, and anger, prejudice, report it to somebody. You can do it here. Report to your representatives and to ask for help. And wipe it out before it flares up. We couldn't do it in Europe because it was done by the government. <coughs> here it's different. And please vote. Yeah. Please vote. Yes. Thank you. Oh, nice seeing you. Do you have a point?